Coming up, we look at the best and brightest ideas in flight training. A beloved aviation movie is coming out on Blu-ray and caught on tape, a Cirrus CAPS deployment saves three lives. The danger, Will Robinson. What American General Aviation pilots can learn from the trials and tribulations of pilots here on Australia burdened by user fees. Plus, the latest on the Aussie's homegrown answer to the caravan, the Airvan 10, the aerial SUV for the rest of us. AOPA Live This Week from Down Under begins in just a moment. This edition of AOPA Live This Week is sponsored by Bank of America, helping pilots offset the cost of flying with the AOPA Bank of America Cash Rewards Credit Card. The battle against user fees may be in a lull, but AOPA is staying vigilant. Thanks for choosing AOPA Live this week. I'm Melissa Rudinger. The budget passed by the United States this week will once again include no user fees on any segment of general aviation. Another a victory for American pilots and a constant battle for AOPA. To understand the devastation user fees can have on GA, we only need to look to Australia. And that's where our own Tom Haynes has been this week. So Tom, what's the story down under? Thanks, Melissa. Yes, a sigh of relief in the US, no user fees. Unfortunately, that ship sailed here in Australia years ago. Here, user fees in privatized airports are a daily and devastating reality. Uh, five zero, okay, Tango, climb straight ahead, please for takeoff. Yes, our system works on a, uh, we do have a fuel levy, but on top of that we have user fees. We pay en route charges to air services, we pay terminal fees, and we pay landing fees to the airports at which we land at. Uh, in themselves, each of these fees are not large amounts, but collectively they considerably add to the cost of operating an aircraft. And those costs have done unbelievable damage to general aviation here in Australia. Look, general aviation is in dire straits. In, in Australia. Just to give you an example, our major secondary airport in Australia, Bankston Airport, the largest general aviation airport in Australia, about 20 years ago had 470,000 movements per year. Now it's down something like 270,000 movements per year. So that's a huge reduction. And if you look around, basically general aviation is reflecting this everywhere. It's really hurting. A lot of people think it's because the government bought in user pays and it uh, privatised the air traffic control system. That's part of it. The overregulation has led to a great deal of tension between the pilots and the regulators. The relationship between general aviation and the regulator in Australia, the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, is pretty unhealthy. Um, there's a perception, uh, right or wrong, uh, that uh, CASA has nothing in their mandate to promote aviation. No, what's happened is that, generally speaking, the regulator, and that's the Civil Aviation Authority, is hostile to general aviation. Among the most controversial issues is maintenance of aging aircraft. Cessna's Supplemental Inspection Documents, or SIDS, are primarily voluntary for private owners in the United States, but not so here in Australia. The Cessna SIDS um, is a big issue. Um, it's mandatory here for all aircraft, not just those operated commercially. Um, we've been dealing, uh, battling with CASA in, in this regard. And so I've had some friends with small Cessnas who have spent thirty and forty thousand dollars in trying to uh, uh, comply with a mandate in Australia that's not compulsory elsewhere. It's the costs. It's it's the um, you know, aircraft owners sort of being hit. Um, time and time again, whether it be Cessna SIDS, medical matters, uh, you know, um, ADs that seem to pop up frequently. Um, and it's all these things that go towards the cost of regulation and people simply you know, stop flying. You know, especially with um, Cessna SIDS, you know, a lot of old Cessna owners have probably left the aircraft um, uh, laid up in the hangar um, it, and the, the value is you know, equivalent to scrap metal. At the same time they are facing mandatory maintenance costs, Aussie pilots, like American ones, must equip with ADSB and do so sooner by the end of 2017 and they don't get the benefits that we do. The impact has been uh, of course a cost factor to all pilots and a lot of pilots are pretty unhappy about it. Uh, unlike the US we have uh, one uh, frequency, the 1090 ES frequency, you have UAT, uh, we don't have that here so we don't uh, have the opportunity to take advantage of some of the cheaper equipment that's out there. 
uh, and of course we don't have the advantage of being able to download weather and all the other things that you can get. At least for now though, pilots flying VFR here don't have to equip with ADS-B. Regardless, our brethren down under see what life is like in the U.S. and they consider us fortunate to have the freedoms and regulatory environment that we have. Uh, the only country in the world which has a thriving general aviation industry, and you might even doubt that, is the United States. And that's because your regulations have uh, allowed the industry to thrive. They haven't been ridiculously expensive. What advice would you have for general aviation pilots in America on how to sustain what it is that we have? Look, the difference in America is uh, Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, I have absolutely no doubt. All around the world, what regulators do, it's natural if someone goes to work for a regulator, is, oh, I'm going to be here for three, four, five years or for my lifetime. How can I improve things? Now, normally by improving things, a person who likes to have a job with a regulator means regulate more increase the costs and in the United States you've had Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association which around the world we're told that it's it's second only to the National Rifle Federation is that your uh, organization which is very NRA, powerful right, right. NRA I should say yeah uh, in as in regards to being a lobbying organization and it's it's been very astute in making sure that you don't get over regulated and that's allowed the industry to thrive uh, if you didn't have AOPA and with strong membership, uh, you would have had real problems. You realize that you need to be part of a larger organization. So organizations like AOPA are pivotal, uh, both to the individual pilot and as a very strong voice to those that don't share our desire to have freedom of the skies and the ability to uh, operate safely at a reasonable cost in that environment. So I would say the sharing starts right at the hangar. The sharing starts with people who you fly with. The sharing starts as uh, being a professional and, uh, and uh, utilizing best practice so that the regulators are not as interested in us. So fly right, fly smart, fly safe. Uh, have that as the way that you present yourself day to day and to your neighbors and to your friends and share that with others and also be part of and join organizations uh, like AOPA and others where uh, that voice um, has some uh, power and some impact with uh, the regulatory decision makers. So there you have it Melissa. In the US we've always said there's strength in numbers to keep the regulators mostly in check Unfortunately, here in Australia, overregulation and costs associated with user fees and privatized airports have driven so many pilots away that the numbers are not strong enough to do battle with the regulators. As a result, general aviation here is a shadow of its former self in this great country. Lessons we Americans should take to heart. Melissa? So, Tom, what can the Australian pilots do? Well, Melissa, no one here is giving up. That's not the Aussie spirit. The current leadership of AOP Australia is becoming more strident in dealing with the regulators. Meanwhile, Dick Smith, who we interviewed earlier, is one of the most famous people in Australia and he continues to be a strong influence in government here. He's on a constant campaign for regulatory reform. This story is far from over. Great, thanks so much, Tom. We'll check back with you a little bit later. From down under to down south, folks in Texas are dealing with massive flooding. In Austin, the control tower at Bergstrom International Airport is shut down. Flood waters caused the facility to go offline. These photos are from Rick Redfern showing a temporary tower that has been brought in. And as we record this, there is an airspace flow program in place. AOPA Live's Warren Morningstar is not far from there. He joins us from San Marcos, home of Redbird Migration. Warren, is the skyport affected by the flooding? Well, no, actually, uh, the San Marcos Airport and the Skyport were not affected by the flooding, but a very quick update. The uh, Austin Tower just reopened. They got their second runway open, but they still have to remote their radar facilities, so uh, things are getting better. But what one of the changes we did see here is that a lot of the GA traffic that would have gone into Austin has been coming in here into San Marcos, so the folks here at the Skyport are very happy because they've been selling a lot of Jet A. Now, of course, we're here in San Marcos for the fifth annual Redbird Migration. This is a chance for flight school operators and CFIs to get together, to network, and to learn. And this is something, you know, that's really important to our industry. And I think perhaps the way you can illustrate how important this gathering is, is the presence of FAA Administrator Michael Huerta. 
Now this is the first time that the administrator has okay, come to this Bird. gathering. But the flight instructor is still the most important person in any pilot's career. You nurse, you encourage, and sometimes you cajole the best from your students. And they will never see you wince if their first solo landing bounces enough times to count as their second, third, and fourth landing. And while this is not new news, the administrator talked again about the change in FAA philosophy to regulate and enforce based on risk and results. Our goal is first to find and fix a problem, then to learn from it, and to share information to prevent a repeat occurrence. Now to do this, we need to have something that's really important, and that is trust, open communication, and cooperation between all aspects of the industry. Both companies and individuals must have an environment where they can disclose honest mistakes, failures, and procedural errors. But the administrator did say it's it's going to take some time for this new FAA philosophy to be fully embraced by the inspectors out in the field. It really is a big change for them. Something else new down here, and this is from Redbird, it's the Redbird Imagine Flight. And the uh, whole point of this is to create a new association of flight schools. These flight school associations will be schools that meet certain standards and for both service and for training. And those schools are going to be supported with their training materials, but more importantly, they're going to be supported with a national advertising campaign to bring students into the door. We've got the, the start of a real national marketing effort to bring people to flying. And that's what's been missing in these national advertising programs up to this point is with Be A Pilot and all of these other programs, it's advertising to the consumer and then having the consumer let down when they go out and try to find a place to do that training. So Imagine Flight is being designed to fix that. Now Imagine Flight is looking to get some 12 to 1500 schools signed up and, it, and these all of course will be schools that are going to meet the association standards. So Warren, what are some of those standards going to be? Well, the, really the most important thing is that they meet the customer's expectations. You know, it won't do any good to do uh, an advertising campaign and then have the customer walk into the door and there's nobody there to greet them or they can't get the training that was advertised. So the standards are going to be such things as uh, their curriculum. Uh, the schools will be providing uh, simulator training and particularly scenario-based uh, simulator training, but there are also going to be standards on customer service. And this is really all very important to revitalizing our industry because, as you know, the problem right now is that uh, flight schools and CFIs don't have enough customers. And they don't have enough customers because we're not creating enough new student pilots. And also, uh, current GA pilots generally don't take uh, any additional training. You know, they get the rating and then they get the BFR, but then they don't get any more training. However, one industry leader sees this problem as an opportunity. Ian Twombly is standing by over in the Redbird Flight Center. And uh, Ian, what is the solution to the problem? Well, Warren, Joe Brown, who heads up Hartzell Propeller, he's a passionate pilot and a GA industry leader, and he thinks we should train more like the pros. And that means a growth opportunity. You can go fly all the stalls you want, but if you don't fly a base to downwind with a smoke and crosswind that might blow you through final, you don't understand really the situation that will get you in trouble. But if you get in a sim and you fly that thing over and over and over again, you get the sight picture for how wind, weather, vector, aircraft, and you all work together under challenging circumstances. So scenario-based skill building is a huge part of this center. Joe Brown had an epiphany one day. Another aha moment that I, I was fortunate to have is in, I, in my own flying life, I got to move up into an aircraft that required some insurance requirements. Um, and that involved going to one of these flight training houses that specializes in a, a given make and model. And that was the first time I ever had a professional instructor sit me in a simulator and work me out. And apart from the fact that it was intimidating and challenging and taught me that I needed to learn more, it also was a real eye-opener, but it's expensive. And so I think the, the, what we really need to be doing is having 
the opportunity to train like you would if you were a professional pilot. If you were going to go to SimCom or you were going to go to one of the other simulator training centers, have an opportunity to do it in your backyard the way you fly and the kinds of airplanes that you fly and in an environment that is really set up for the general aviation pilot and the kinds of, the kinds of training that they really need to stay proficient and safe. And it's simulators like these that now bring the cost of professional skill training down to what a GA pilot can afford. So you're on downwind, about to turn base. You've definitely got that wind in there and um, 30 knot crosswind you've got from the, the right there. <laughs> you know, you're able to look to the left or the right. You know, you're looking for the runway. You're looking for uh, your aim point. Really doing everything in the airplane and going through those same procedures that you would in the airplane, you know, you can do in the sim. Yeah, I mean, I got completely blown through uh, final, <laughs> way low, slow. So that's what's possible. But will you be able to find affordable skills training at your home base? As the Redbird vision is to align flight schools into this kind of curriculum so that you call them up and say, I just want to do skill building. And they say, great, we got a package for you. It's, it's four hours on a Saturday. We're just trying to set the hook that proficiency matters and part of the joy of being a pilot is getting better all the time. This network is part of a Redbird's Imagine Flight initiative. And that means they use an approved curriculum to do scenario-based training in the simulator to proficiency. So Ian, is this uh, really going to work? Well, their hope is that you'll experience the proficiency center at Oshkosh as a proof of concept and they go seek out the training when you get home. Warren? Thanks, Ian. And finally, something else to get these flight training professionals to think a little bit about marketing flying. They were issued a special challenge here at the migration. They were broken into small teams and they were given the challenge of creating a TV commercial to market flying. Now to add to their challenge, they, were, they had to incorporate cheese whiz and the phrase it's all ball bearings nowadays in, in their presentations. And then there was a Galo Award ceremony hosted by John and Martha King. And the winner of the best overall film is Team 11, Go By Air. No. Come on, we can do this without. No. Push into your bum, bring those legs right back. Good girl. Oh, good girl, go on then. <laughs> Wasn't that great, Melissa? And uh, amazingly, they only had three hours to create those commercials. Now you can see some of the other commercials on imagineflight.org slash migration. Back to you, Melissa. Remarkable. I'll definitely check that out. And speaking of flight training, AOPA is recognizing the best and the brightest in flight training as selected by their students. It's the 2015 Flight Training Excellence Awards. The best flight school of 2015 is AeroVenture Institute in Southbridge, Mass. Todd, Todd Shellnut of Atlanta is the best flight instructor, and there are many more schools and CFIs honored. You can find a list at AOPA.org. And a win for AOPA in the Fight for WAC charts. The FAA has announced a plan to discontinue World Aeronautical charts this past summer. AOPA convinced the FAA to continue supporting the charts temporarily, and a survey went out to AOPA members to determine that without WACs, new charts would be needed for Alaska and the Caribbean. As a result, 
The FAA is creating a new Alaska VFR wall planning chart and two Caribbean VFR charts to make up for the loss of WAC charts. These charts should provide more coverage than the existing WAC charts do today. And speaking of news from the FAA, they are in the last stage of implementing their new NOTAM search website. Instead of having to read the pages and pages of NOTAMs on a cross country, users can put in their flight path and see only the NOTAMs affecting them. The site can also decipher NOTAMs so they can be read in plain text. The search site is a replacement for Pilot Web, and AOPA helped work on the site as part of the NOTAM improvement panel. A prototype supersonic jet is getting a lot of attention from the mainstream media this week. Inventor Charles Bombardier wrote a column in the Globe and Mail about his proposed Screamer jet. The jet would reach speeds of Mach 10, allowing passengers to get from New York to London in 30 minutes. Before becoming reality, the jet has some major engineering obstacles to overcome, like how to keep passengers conscious. Uh, the engine would actually have to fire and the jet would have to accelerate to supersonic speeds while still on the ground. Coming up after the break, a Cirrus parachute save caught on tape and leaf peeping via drone. What leaps higher than a kangaroo and is wider than a wombat? We'll find out in just a moment when he'll be alive this week from Australia continues. Welcome back. You're watching AOPA Live this week. Most pilots will tell you that 1-6 Wright is an inspiring aviation film. It tells the story of a pilot's passion for flying at the Van Nuys Airport. The movie turns 10 years old next month. It's being re-released on Blu-ray to mark the occasion. The filmmakers remastered the original footage and the Blu-ray has six times the resolution of the DVD. The Cirrus airframe parachute system saved more lives this week and it's all caught on video. This SR-22T was being flown by the former CEO of Walmart. He reported oil pressure issues shortly after takeoff from Fayetteville, Arkansas. He made a decision to find a safe place and pull the chute. AOPA Air Safety Institute Executive Director George Perry says it's an example of why the FAA should streamline the process of allowing safety equipment to be put on aircraft. These parachute deployments are really uh, an example of how safety innovation is, is helping make GA safer. And what's also important to, to remember is AOPA is working with the FAA to make it easier to retrofit existing aircraft with the safety enhancing technologies going forward so we can all be safer. This is the 55th reported CAPS deployment and more than 100 lives are credited as being saved by it. And Cirrus is making strides on their new vision center. The company broke ground on the location at McGee Tyson Airport in Knoxville, Tennessee. Factory service center operations are at the vision center and are slated to open in the first half of 2016, while the remaining customer activities are targeted to commence during the second half of 2016. And now back to Tom Haynes, just outside Melbourne, Australia, for the latest on an airplane getting the attention of a Cessna Caravan customers. Well, thanks, Melissa. I'm in Morwell, in the southeast corner of Australia, in the state of Victoria, not far from Melbourne, as the locals pronounce it. Mahindra Aerospace is expecting Australian certification of the Airvan 10 single-engine turboprop in the next few months. My first exposure to the Airvan 8 was a number of years ago in Belize where I was a passenger in the Lycoming powered mini airliner. I was impressed and anxious to try it out myself. Longtime friends George Morgan and Peter Furlong formed Gippsland Aeronautics in 1984, originally developing upgrades to Piper Pawnee Ag airplanes. Seeing those tired 206s and Piper Cherokee 6s working hard in the outback, they set out to build a new generation of bush plane for Southeast Asia and beyond. The result? The Airvan 8, an amazing combination of payload, simplicity, and durability that has found a home doing everything from missionary work and disaster recovery to skydiving and high-tech surveillance over the world's cities. Now owned by India's Mahindra Aerospace, the company is seeking even bigger global markets for the two models with potentially more to come. The Airvan 8 seats eight with an aisle in the passenger compartment. Customers wanted a big double door that could open in flight and one large enough to take a forklift pallet straight into the cabin. The simple but beefy Lycoming IO540 comes in two versions, 300 horsepower normally aspirated and 320 horsepower turbocharged. Both provide the simplicity and dependability expected in an airplane meant to work off-road. 
The main landing gear are tubular steel and the nose gear uses a coiled spring dampened by oil. No fussy strut system to go flat. Cruise speed, about 135 knots true at 10,000 feet, while carrying some 1,800 pounds. The Air Van 10 adds two more seats in a stretched fuselage. Powered by a Rolls-Royce 450 shaft horsepower engine, the Air Van 10 promises improved performance and the ability to burn jet fuel, an important consideration in many parts of the world. So Melissa, Mahindra expects great things from the Air Van 10 as it comes to market while the piston-powered Air Van 8 builds its own market share. So Tom, you had a chance to fly an Air Van 8 on floats a few months ago in Alaska. What's the status on that? I did. Development of both airplanes on straight and amphibious floats continues with the summer marketing survey work in Alaska a great success for Mahindra. Certification expected by next summer for the amphibious Air Van 8 straight floats to follow shortly thereafter. One thing the two countries have in common is the pace at which certification programs occur. Watching paint dry comes to mind. Look for more on the air vans in an upcoming issue of AOPA Pilot. Back to you, Melissa. Thanks, Tom. We'll see you back here next week. It may be the start of spring down under, but it'll be winter here in the northern hemisphere before we know it. And the FAA has just released an updated list of cold temperature restricted airports. These airports routinely get cold enough that adjustments to altitudes are needed to make sure pilots can clear obstacles in IMC. Learn more and find the updated list and by going to AOPA.org and click on Advocacy under the News and Video tab. With the FAA now preparing to require registration of most unmanned aircraft, we talked to one commercial operator who looks forward to that development and to the education that will come with it. T Jim Moore tagged along for a day in the scenic Poconos of Pennsylvania to see firsthand what a $50,000 drone can do. The safe integration with UAV and manned airplanes is absolutely critical. Frank Galella is both an AOPA member and an authorized commercial unmanned aircraft operator. I've been in the aviation business since 1988 and um, you know, having a repair station and a flight school and a sales division, and I got interested in the, in the UAVs and we started building a few of our own platforms. And uh, that's before anybody knew what they really were, um, before you ever saw one on the news. His company was hired this summer to film Skytop Lodge in the Pennsylvania Poconos. What that then provides us is that different perspective that people then draw closer into and then they're going to dive a little bit deeper into our website. Galella returned in October to show his client the footage and show me how it was done. There is just no way to capture what's here unless you do it the way we did it. Most times we're below 200 feet, most times for sure we're below 400 feet AGL. And uh, you know our beauty shots, the work that we do, the whole reason why we're using the UAVs and not conventional airplanes is because we need to be up and close to our target. A UAV like we use today uh, for the purpose of getting some beauty shots and uh, just short of a show and tell type of thing uh, equipped the way it was are about $50,000 with the equipment that we have on board and the monitors that we use um, so that we can see what the camera is doing. Galella's usual crew didn't make this trip, so it was my job to operate the camera. I got a detailed briefing, a crash course, if you will, in aerial videography. I'll put the ship facing the, the pine tree, mm -hmm. and then all you do is, you'll see this come back around, I'll put this over here, all you do is hit reset, and it'll go back to my front. Mm -hmm. So that means we're both in sync again. <clears throat> now we do a quick stability check. I make sure I have all my controls. Go up to about 14 meters and my landing gear goes up. We had a handwriting operation manual, a lot like a 135 operation would have to do. Um, we have a safety and procedures manual. We have a checklist like you mentioned, and we also have a pilot operating handbook. The ships that we fly do have redundant autopilots and they have redundant GPSs. So uh, we have a few get out of jail free cards before things really could go bad uh, with a unit. And you know, potentially, usually if you're flying in the area that you're supposed to be flying in, um, there is a NOTAM out when we're flying a commercial job. It covers a certain area. 
and uh, the likelihood of that machine having enough battery to fly far enough away from our NOTAMed airspace uh, before it runs out of power is highly unlikely. Um, the battery's going to deplete and the ship's going to come down on its own, hopefully before it does any potential damage. The capability of these aircraft is impressive. Pilot and camera operator work as a team, each focused on specific tasks and both focused on safety. Okay, go. None of this footage was stabilized in post-production. What you're seeing now was filmed in a gusty wind, probably about 10 knots. An aircraft and camera system this sophisticated can handle that with ease. This is the future, a new way to look at our world, a new tool for many jobs. From film production to search and rescue, 3D mapping, bridge and building inspections, it's also a new professional opportunity for those of us who have a pilot certificate already. At Skytop Lodge in Skytop, Pennsylvania, I'm Jim Moore, AOPA Live. AOPA has joined the Government and Industry Task Force that is now crafting the details of the new drone registration rule, a requirement that will expand to non-commercial systems, including models that are much smaller and less expensive than the one you just saw. Skytop Lodge offers complimentary shuttle service to and from local GA airports, and you can learn more at AOPA.org. And that's it for this edition. I'm Melissa Rudinger. Tom Haynes will be back from Down Under next week. See you then.